You run Felicis Ventures. Yes. Um, uh, before that, years ago in 1999, you were Google's first product manager? Yes. Very when first. Google was only available in English, and I was the first non-engineer they hired for a non-engineer role. They're like, what are we going to do with you? They're like, what do you do? And I'm like, I speak languages. They're like, great. You want to launch Google in languages? And that's what I did. Fantastic. I bet you got a lot of equity joining in 1999. Uh, it, it worked I out. I just can say that I was very <laughs> grateful to Larry and Sergey for not being stingy. Very good. Um, and at Felicis, you've got a couple big investments that people probably have heard of. Credit Karma is one big one. Adyen, which is not it, 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 no, no relation to your name. Yes. Um, but those uh, are two of your big investments. Those are two big current investments. We also had Shopify and Fitbit go public last year. Okay. Really proud of Shopify also because my wife is Canadian. Our first IPO was a Canada a company from Ottawa. Um, on Adyen, I'm particularly proud of it because you being from Wall Street Journal, when we were announcing the first major founding, the Wall Street Journal person is like, we don't have this company in our database. Normally, you guys are so on top of news. I was really proud of it because I chased it for it's three years. It's a subtle years. dig at us right, right now. Exactly. We're, we're not doing our job. <laughs> um, but it's a great company that handles uh, payments in 180 countries and 250 methods, and they power some of the largest tech companies. I followed it for three years. Happens to be a Dutch company. The name is just Suriname for Second Life. This is their second payments company. Has a striking similarity to my name. The funny anecdote there is I had to spend half an hour while we were closing the deal to convince the founders that I'm not investing because it sounds just like my name. One is Dutch, one's Turkish, so you're, you're fine. Okay, yeah. so with this audience, let's start right away with, you've done a lot of early stage stuff in your career, and a lot of people in this audience are curious uh, about what do you do in this environment if you've raised your seed, but you don't know if you're gonna get to that A. I mean, look, honestly, it's a tough situation because when I started 10 years ago, um, I think we were very excited about more startups coming, and I'm still very excited about it. The reality is that, you know, kind of towards the top of the funnel, the number of companies that are getting A rounds and then the ones that get to like really, really large, meaningful scale has not changed that drastically. So I think the only thing I can tell to the audience that can be really meaningful is Unfortunately, we always read the stories of these companies that are edge cases like the 25 million A's or whatever. You know, it just comes down to like, it's the same thing that I face. I can relate because when I raised my institutional fund, I could have just kept writing personal checks as an angel, but I had 40 no's before I had my first yes. That's why I think we really relate to our founders. And I always thought that I had a story and I didn't realize how important it is to tell that story well to convince the people not just the facts, but the mechanism of getting the facts. So it's not like I'm raising an A because I need to raise an A, but I have a product that works, this is why it works, this is why it can work at scale, and this is why I need the money to take it to the next level. Um, you know, I obviously wish all of these companies in the audience to do really well. The reality is that the bar keeps getting higher. In fact, it's another thing that we can touch. It used to be that all you need to do is show charts that go up and to the right. And I think people have gotten smarter that they not only want to see growth, but they want to see efficient growth, i.e. companies that can create success at scale with as little it, resources as it, possible. It, all, it used to be, you know, go back two years, everything was growth, growth at all costs. What happened? Why did that change? There's still a ton of money in the market um, available to invest. I think the stock market's at record highs. Yes. Uh, historically, people wake up to the fact that you can go really fast by selling a dollar for 10 cents. There will be a lot of customers, and then sooner or later, the reality catches up to them. So I think one of the things that I'm seeing more and more, and we've, we've ourselves became a lot more instrumented, but understanding the mechanism of that growth and how efficient it can happen. Like we did a really interesting benchmarking survey, and it turned out our you know two most interesting companies, Credit Karma and Fitbit, they were not like these obvious venture hits. And like that's another thing. We have so many interesting founders and companies that are not super celebrity hot. These like crazy hot companies. Um, but we found that both of them, and especially Fitbit being a hardware company, was still in the top 10% 
of cash efficiency of generating revenues. So there is a very strong correlation between companies that produce the most with few people and that produce the most with as little dollars as possible. What's now happening is everybody else is catching to that. So they not only want to see the growth, but they want to see the growth being generated by a very efficient mechanism of whatever the why? company is doing. Why? Why did that change? Because it means that they're not going to need as much capital in the future. Well, I know. I know why. It's why it makes sense. Yeah. Of course. This seems obvious. So what was going on two years ago, and why did we all of a sudden, it seems like in the fall of 2015, decide to turn it fall into winter and decide, oh, well, actually, now it makes sense to operate profitably. Absolutely. Um, and let me just mention one quick stat before I continue answering it. So we've recently seen uh, and was part of a very interesting study that looked at 400 companies. And so it's basically looking at the multiple you get on your revenues at exit and public, and then it correlates it to not only your growth rate, but your ability to produce free cash flow or EBITDA. The difference between the bottom and the top is like five to six X. So if I told you that I made an investment and I got six X on it, that would be considered great. The two companies can have exactly the same revenues, could be you know, valued six X based on the fundamental of if they can generate those sales efficiently or not. So I'm just quantifying it so it makes sense to the audience. In terms of this aspect of why two years ago growth was like at all costs, I think what happens is there are a few people that always follow good discipline and have good instrumentation, but then at times of hype, when it's really, really easy to get money and invest money, people get a little bit more lax and you have a lot of new uh, entrants and you know they try to do it kind of a more obvious, easy way, and then it reverts back to, like, people see the fundamentals. Could again. we get, uh, could people get excited? You know, people like to talk more about animal spirits. Now that IPO, the IPO market is starting, sort of, to look like it'll open. We saw Twilio, we saw Nutanix. These things go like this with a, a, a limited float on the IPO. But they're still up. So they, they still had a pretty pretty nice return post IPO. Let's, so let's does that open things that. up? Does this does this give liquidity to people? Say, oh, okay, we can make some money on our investments. That loosens things up again. Let's touch on that because I want to mention a couple of really interesting stats. Um, first interesting stat: even though that we have seen only very few IPOs this year because of deals like LinkedIn and other public companies being taken private, hundred billion dollars of money opened up in public markets, meaning there were public stocks that are no longer available that contain $100 billion where that money now needs to go to other places and those companies don't exist. So I think there is a very good fundamental outlook for companies that do have the fundamentals. I also speak, spoken to these public investors they are like, we would like to invest in private companies, but we do not want to invest in the companies that are selling a dollar for 10 cents. So that's one fact. I think the other fact, for the first time this year, despite this gloom and doom of like Series A's like being difficult to raise, we had two companies in our portfolio that got to zero to 10 million revenues in record time. One is actually not even in the US, and neither of them are traditional, like obvious areas. So I think I'm more optimistic and bullish than ever that the impact of technology is getting higher. In fact, I was just wondering about previous questions. I don't know if you guys realize, but in the last 15 years, the number of the, the top five ranks, the world's five most valuable companies, 15 years ago there was one tech company and it wasn't the top one. Right now there are five companies, every single one of them tech, and the top three have higher market cap than any other time in history than any other industrialized company. All five are bigger than Exxon? Isn't Exxon up there? All three of them are bigger than Exxon. Okay. Exxon is not even up there. Exxon okay. is not even in the top five. Okay. The top five are uh, Apple, Google, and Microsoft, I believe. Uh, and there are two more tech companies, but um, could be Amazon and Facebook. But it's very interesting that these, the, the top, top five are all tech companies now. Okay, um, I wanna jump back to something we were talking about a second ago. Uh, are there creative ways when we think about um, startups stuck post-seed? They've hit some metrics, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's not a disaster. They're actually making some progress, um, but they're not knocking the cover off the ball, which yeah. means a big A is tough. But so, what, what's the solution? Are the creative solutions look for those kinds of companies so that they can continue to survive in this environment? Absolutely. So, the the number one thing is there is no certainty in how and when you're going to raise funding. So, the one thing that I see companies get caught off a lot is number one, you're driving a car. What is the number one thing? 
now for those who are not driving electric cars, including the electric cars, don't run out of electricity, don't run out of gas. It sounds so obvious. Do you know how many boards and founders that I've talked to were having a frank discussion? How is everything going? Everything is going great. Up and to the right, all of a sudden I'm like, how much cash runway is there? Three months. And I'm like, shouldn't alarm bells be ringing? I would be started like thinking about that when there is 12 months of cash, let alone nine, because that gives you time to react to any adversity. You can make changes when there is three months of you know, runway left and you're going and having funding conversations, they're gonna run away from you, no matter how good your story is. Um, the second thing, and so I want- Part wanna, of the answer is, don't, don't wait. Don't money, don't wait, okay. Second thing is, look, I know that everybody out there, it's like asking a parent, is your kid cute or great? Of course they're gonna say it's great. Every founder that's in the audience, you know that you believe in your product, your team, and I know you're doing something great. But the originality and how important it is and how you tell that story is equally important. And so again, like coming back to what we do, like when we started in venture capital, like I had 10 VCs tell me that I'm a crazy maniac, I don't have a great background, and I can never do venture capital. It turns out that if you put your mind to it and you, instead of copying, paste, and old method, you think differently, and you, know, you can make it work, it, it, it can generate good results. So the point that I'm trying to make is, you gotta find a different way of getting to something that is really important and critical, where when people hear the story, if you're trying to sell it too hard, it's just not gonna happen. Like the product and the solution has to speak for itself, where it has to inspire people and it has to solve an important problem, and the story itself has to be unique enough. It's like, you're in the same boat. How many people a day pitch a story to you? A hundred, a thousand? At fifty. Fifty. Okay, fifty. How many of those a lot. I actually a lot get turn into a story? Zero of those. Exactly. Exactly. So it's like me asking you, Rolf, how do I get a story in Wall Street Journal? I called you ten times, you never return my calls. I tell you how great our venture firm is. I keep asking you to write about us in Wall Street Journal, but I don't see it on the You, you do page. me a favor, you give me a scoop, and then I feel like I owe you a favor. That's right. So let's work on the scoop and yes. other stuff. Um uh, I completely lost my train of thought there now. I'm thinking about how I do my job. Um, uh, okay, so let's talk about, never mind from the, from the company side, from the financing side. Yeah. Um, it's crowded out there. It is crowded out there. Especially at the angel and seed stage. Absolutely. Too many people, a lot of, do, do, a lot of that money, does that need to go away? Um, you know, I don't know if it needs to go away. Like, I really honestly, like, try to focus. Like, I really do believe in this adage that one of the greatest way to kill value is competition. We ourselves are focusing on all the areas that the other investors are not thinking about, and hence the title contrarian investing. I think in terms of the angel and seed investors there, like, on the one hand, it's great because it promotes entrepreneurship. On the other hand, I think fundamentals are tough because I feel like there are 100 to 1,000 more companies but the number of exits have not drastically changed, so it'll be very interesting how that resolves now, you, itself. You mean more, more funds? We, you, there are many more funds you're talking about. I think, look, the funds out there are great. I, I just feel, you know, I never like run my strategy based on, oh, wouldn't it be great if half the venture capital disappeared so we have an easier life? In fact, I but, do but exactly that the suck. opposite. Let's, let's, but, let, let, that wouldn't be bad. That, that'd be nice for you, though. Yeah. It would no, be good. No, no, no. Actually, I don't even care, and that's the point that I want to make is like, look, I would be happy if there is 10 times the venture capital out there because our strategy is so decoupled what other people do. I'm like, that's totally fine. Great. I'm so happy for the entrepreneurs, for them to get funding. Maybe that'll help with the Series A crunch. But we go find companies before they become attractive. Like every one of our great companies, they're building products for the 99%. They're in places like Ottawa, Canada, or like Amsterdam, Holland, Melbourne, Australia. Um, there are also like states like, you know, uh, Atlanta, uh, states like Georgia and Utah, you'd be like really like surprised if being treated like a foreign country here. Like anything outside of Silicon Valley, oh my God, San Jose, that's 408. I'm like, that's a 20 minute drive. It's not another country. You can get into a car, you can drive, it's not the end of the world. So is this the Felicia's secret sauce? You know, our Ge secret Geographic sauce. Diver diversification almost? Our secret sauce, the easiest way I can describe it, traditional venture investing is all about focus. Invest close to the home, Invest in a narrow range, invest what you know, invest in a particular stage, like seed, growth, something like that. We totally turned it on its head, which makes it much more difficult to operate, and we said, look, that's like 2D. 
Why don't we make it 3D? Instead, we said, we're going to be stage agnostic, we're going to be sector agnostic, and we're going to be geo-agnostic, like literally breaking every rule of traditional venture investing. But what people don't understand is as difficult as it is to make it work, for us, it drastically increases serendipity of finding great companies, because we're not saying that we're going to invest in an enterprise company only, like maybe at that time, the great company is financial services. We're not saying that we want an enterprise company, but only if it's in Silicon Valley. One of our best, like, I think, platform companies came out of Ottawa, Canada. So why not just fly to Ottawa and try to get to know that team? And so it has worked really well for us. And the beautiful thing is no matter if there are 100 venture investors out there or 10,000, very few of them are willing to like, do the hard thing, go to Ottawa, or come up with a strategy that's much more difficult. Every, everyone out there, your, your tip is go open an office in Ottawa, Canada. And this, we did not. That's the key. Yeah. You do not um, need to in an office. So. Okay, but... With all this, this is a good, uh, a good way to differentiate yourselves a little bit. Um, what is the knock-on effect of, I mean, valuations are still pretty high for good companies with all the capital that's run, running around chasing the best deals. You know what? So are you doing, I guess my question is, that's got to make it harder for you. Are you doing fewer deals than you have no, in years let past? Me, let me throw real stats at you. So even with all the valuation increases, we've just had our annual meeting, so we did a very special analysis. We looked at our entry valuations and what we're carrying the companies at. The average difference between when we invested in the companies and where they're at right now is still 20x, 20x. Right? So what I'm thinking is, look, even if there is 10, 10 times more investors, the economy is crumbling down, Trump turned out to be a lot worse than we expected, shit like crap comes into the hand, even if everything is worth a quarter of what it is, we're still at 5x. It's called a margin of safety. For those of you who like Warren Buffett, the main concept of value uh, investing is margin of safety. Right? So I think that's the reason. And when it comes to these valuations, one of the things that gives me like twitches is valuation is so subjective. Right? So you can look at a thing that this is the value of a company. Look, the value of the company is when somebody actually pays that price. So when you get around, but more importantly, when you go public. And so when people talk about, oh my god, it's been so expensive to invest in companies, the way we think about it, it look, for some companies, even a high price is still a bargain, we spend zero amount of time on it. What we instead look at is what needs to go right for that company to be successful, and probabilistically, where is that? As a result, that's the reason why we tend to bag a lot of founders that are not sexy, that are not popular, but we do our homework, and when other people think that this is a crazy story or not attractive story, we can still you know, believe in the same dream, and that has helped us a lot. But, but how do you find that margin of safety? I mean, the, the whole point of that is you don't pay too high a price, right? The margin of safety you build, you build into, into buying a stock with somebody like Warren Buffett, it's a lot easier because we're talking about a company exactly. that has cash flow, Exactly. right? Um, but never mind, the point is you don't pay too much for that cash flow. Exactly. So in, the corollary for you is you don't want to pay too much for you know, perceived future cash flow, um, so the point that I want to make... How do you actually do that? I mean, it's that nice I, that your old investments yeah. have uh, appreciated a lot, but yeah. what do you do about trying to find new investments? Um, and we still find them because what the point that I wanted to make is I wanted to bring up a historical fact. We have a very unique fund. It's only 10 years old. We made about 200 investments, but we had three IPOs and 63 exits. And the interesting thing is we went back historically and say, look, can we basically like make sure that we are not crazy? And it turned out that half the deals that we've invested were at the time of investing what we thought was expensive. So remember, we're talking about this point in time. We don't know if actually things are expensive, then in the future it could be 3x from now, and we can look back and say, that, that was a bargain, it was really cheap. And so the point that I'm trying to make is that when I look at the companies that actually have gotten to scale, gotten public, or gotten acquired, half of those were really expensive deals. So the, the, the thing is, like, that's the reason why it's really hard, where you need to look at the company's value creation potential. And in our business, that's the hard thing. That's the black box of if you're really good at that, those companies keep creating value. Even if that multiple applied on that value shrinks, the value itself doesn't change. So remember, price has two components. It's the intrinsic value of the company company, which is a fact and doesn't change, then there is kind of like what the market, you know, puts on it as a premium. That can like, you know, change a lot. That's what we're talking about. Is there a bubble in the market or not? Is it cheap or expensive or not? But as long as you nail this really well, 
then this part, even if it moves, you're still going to do well. Is so there a bubble the right now? Do you, do you think there's, it's, it's still it's too working expensive? For us. It's working for us. So I think this approach has helped us quite a bit. The approach has worked. But broadly speaking, where evaluate, you know, how are valuations? Do you think that today we, you would call this environment a bubble too expensive? You know what? Pick, I, your, pick your adjective. Let, let me put it on this. I am not going to comment on things that are expensive or cheap. What I'm going to say is there is a majority of the people that don't really understand the underlying dynamics of the price they're paying, right? So I'm going beyond the cheap or expensive. Like I can have people in the audience that might not have a lot of money, but they still would like to buy something expensive. And to them, it's still good value. So expensive or cheap is a very subjective term, right? But as an investor, that's not important. You can be buying all the things expensive, but at the end, if it turns out to be a good investment, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that if you have good heuristics and you find companies, despite high prices, you still get a multiple on it, you're a hero. Um, as a founder, if you manage your company well, don't run out of like, you know, money, and you have a really great product that resonates, you're going to keep doing well. Um, so that's, that, that's okay. the point. Um, we have a lot of time, I think, but I do want to give people a chance to ask questions in the middle of the session, at the end of the session. Has anybody out there got anything that they want to ask? Pause it or for we questions? Can, we can keep talking. We can keep talking. But we'd anybody? rather listen to you if you want to ask some so We got, sounded like, oh, somebody in the back? Oh, okay, okay, never mind. But yeah, guys, we guys, we got mics up here. Ask questions. I'm gonna get boring, so you know, help me out. Um, one thing we talked a little bit about before we came over here was paper markups for mm -hmm. funds. Yes. Um, and the role those have played in the, 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 the expansion of the fundraising of of the funding fundraising class. Um, that's something that you've had on your mind. I did, and in fact, I think. It's not only relevant to investors, it's relevant to founders in the audience too, because as investors, um, you think about your portfolio is evaluated and because these companies are private, every time there's a new round, you mark it up, right? And sometimes there are these really, really hot rounds and it might give you this false hope of, oh my God, we had this great run and you know, I'm a brilliant investor, I have a 10x return, but that's not a realized return, right? And as a founder, also there are times where the company is really hot and all of a sudden, and, um, and hopefully all of you are fortunate, but you might find that yourself in a moment where investors are throwing money at you. And that's the reason why I keep trying to focus on intrinsic value of the company. And so, you know, we are really, really lucky in the sense that we had very good LPs and we chose our LPs based on the experience they had. And our first board meeting or second, we're about to like tell them like how great we are and all these great up rounds we're generating. The first question came in like, you don't care about your up rounds. Like, can you please tell us what these companies do and they have real traction? And so we That is different. That's a little different it because different. I have heard that LPs, we have some in the audience, maybe you can explain this, but um, I, we got a, a wave right here. Um, yeah. They like the markups because at least when it comes to maybe an endowment or something, you're we, getting you're getting we, bonused we on the paper LPs. value because everybody else is getting their annual bonus. But if I can just five seconds finish the point, so we basically make it a, a religion to track our company's performance. And by the way, we're also super transparent. If you click on the numbers on our homepage, every one of our stats, including not just the investments we made, but jobs we created through our companies. So all of it is there, but like our companies, the top 40 of them have like been generating sales of 4 billion, which doesn't include Fitbit and Shopify, which alone would be like 1.3 billion. So we don't look at our success as up rounds, but we look at like the intrinsic value our companies have generated. And I think that's the approach that has helped us discover companies early that once the masses discovered those companies end up being very valuable companies. But, and, okay, but, and so you guys haven't seen any pressure. Have you seen pressure? Have you heard of pressure elsewhere in Silicon Valley to write things up? Um, to help raise that next fund? Um, I think, look, basically one of the things that's happening, because there's been so much investing activity, exits are still extremely hard to come by, so people use the markups as a proxy of, we are great investors, look at these markups. And I, I respect it. I mean, some of these companies will be legitimate successes. All I'm saying is that that's a very precarious road because some of these companies can also go the other way. There is no guarantee that things are mocked up on paper and that's going to turn into an IPO or a guaranteed exit. Or if you're a founder, you know, having raised a lot of money at a very attractive valuation can come back to hurt you and haunt you. So it's relevant on both sides. I got a tough question for you on that one. Anything. Anything. Um, 
You guys were in the D round of Practice Fusion. We were. You were, and that had a 2x liquidation preference in it. Um, and I thought, I thought that was interesting. Talk a little bit about the structures that some of these uh, companies have put into their rounds. And I know in that case, it made it very difficult for those guys when it turns out, you know, they do the, the, the D round, I think it was 2014. Yeah. Um, and fast forward, they're not hitting their numbers, they're burning cash, they need yeah. more money. Really hard to raise that next round because there's this structure in the D, right? That changes, uh, basically changes the incentives of the, of the people in the boardroom. Absolutely. Um, Can I touch on that? Yeah. It's a really important thing. And I want you guys to see like an honest, frank discussion. So number one, I'm very proud to be a practice fusion investor. And I invested in the company when there were five people. And there was the first product demo. And I believed in the dream. Let's be very honest. I did not set the Series D terms. Uh, I think we did a very small pro rata amount. Here is the, the, the thing. There is no such thing as a free ride. This is related to your question of paper markups. Investors are willing to give you a high price because that's the sexy thing that gets you coverage in Wall Street Journal when you get that billion dollar valuation. But people say, I will give you that billion dollar valuation. But here is my ratchet. Here is my liquidation preference. Here is like the five other terms. It's like signing your life to the devil. The devil is you know, willing to show you a great time. You just don't realize the sacrifice you're making to see that good time. And you have to make that trade off. So the point that I'm trying to make, there was so much pressure on the founder and I'm not saying there's a right or wrong decision. When you make decisions for certain reasons, you got to be able to accept the consequences of your decisions, right? That's why sometimes my founders hate me because I tell them, look, other investors don't even care. You have three months of cash runway. I'm going to be like ringing alarm bells when you have 12 months of cash runway. They're like, you're a fucking like boring conservative lunatic. And I'm like, no, because I don't ever want you to have any issues with fundraising. When we have time, I can help you. When we don't have time, I cannot help you. So it's the same thing where like, we can look at these situations and they're very dire and you know, they might or might not be unfortunate. It's still a very important company. They created cloud EHR from scratch and they used by you know, tens of thousands of practices. So I'm really proud of their success, especially having written the check when they were five people. But you know, in the process of that company, you have to make tough decisions. That's why we cannot look at things and say, this is cheap, this is expensive expensive or I won because I closed this round at 600 million or 500 million dollar valuation because if you make the wrong choices, the wrong trade-offs, at some point if things don't go right, it's going to come back to haunt you and it's tough. And the only thing that we can bring to our founders is data points and experience and say, look, this is your company, you will make the decision. All we can do is give you context, give you data points that hopefully will, will, will improve your decision making or help you make a bigger, better decision. So one recommendation here probably is put up with a little bit more dilution if it means you're gonna get a clean term sheet. I mean, all else being equal, yes. But like I said, these decisions, it belongs to the founders. Yeah. We've learned, like we've been, probably we were the first VC firm to actually bother to do a net promotion survey. And you know, our founders tell us that the one thing that they care about their investors is to be very friendly and to respect the founders' decisions themselves. As a result, we committed to always be on the same side with our founders. Question over here. Yeah, hey, Aiden. Um, so you're willing to invest in some pretty contrarian stuff. I'd love to hear what you think the craziest deal you've ever done is and why. I mean, we've done many crazy deals. Uh, we invested in Cruise. We invested in Dollar Shave Club, where everybody thought it, like Dubin was crazy. I invested in Cruise, and I tell you a great story. So. I was the first investor in Justin TV. Uh, Cruz is one of the founders of Justin TV, right? So the founder comes to us, and we weren't in the first two seed rounds, but we were, I think, in the third seed round. At first, I'm like this self-driving car, I don't know. You guys did a great job with Justin TV, can this work? But then they were, I love those guys, and I'm like, no, I gotta be able to do it, right? And I'm thinking, great, like I know these founders, they're super technical. So my first test drive in a cruise power car is the morning after the night of the Twitch exit. I get into the car, they come into the car, and they're like, Aiden, we gotta tell you, we've been partying till 4 a.m., we just had the Amazon exit, 
Um, we're not quite sober, and by the way, before we drive the car, the engineer in the back is uploading the new version of the software into the car, <laughs> and we're gonna go. This is a total true story. I wish they'd taken a picture of my face on the highway because I was like white. Um, we go on the highway, the car misses every turn, we crash like five into five cars, and I'm like, fuck, like just <laughs> dumbest idea ever, we just totally blew it. The reason why I'm telling you this story, some of our best companies, if I I told you how many times in their histories we're like, we are just screwed, this company is gonna fail, like they're not gonna raise any money, we're just like, fuck, these people are crazy, and it just worked, and like what happened is, six months later, like the founder invited me, I didn't look, we feel really bad, you probably were about to throw up and hurl in the car, but just look at this new version, and that version was like, as good as like, even better than Tesla's self-drive. And the point that I'm trying to make is as human beings, like we have this thing that we look at the history a lot, we look at the current things a lot, and we just cannot make that extrapolation, right? We look at Elon and like, I don't know how many people know, but six times Tesla ran out of money like the next day, and yet it's the great company, like SpaceX SpaceX probably, blew up a couple rockets before blew they. Blew up a couple rockets, and so like the point that I'm trying to make it is like Credit Karma is another good example, right? It's credit scores. How many people get excited about credit scores? Like zero in the audience, like people are like, are you shooting rockets to Mars? Like that's what you wanna hear about. But the reality is like I was having a conversation with the Credit Karma founder, he's like, look, you Silicon Valley guys, you always wanna invest in the products for the 1%. We are really hot in places like Orlando, Florida. 99% of America lives and dies by the credit score, right? They have you know, small jobs, small salaries. The only way they can get a car or home is by their credit score. And it's the first company that truly impacted people's credit scores. As a result, it's a really valuable company. And can I tell you how many times investors didn't want to invest in this company? What is it, Credit Karma? How fast are they growing? Like, no. Hundreds of millions in revenue at this bootstrap. point. They've, the got, they've now got hundreds of millions in revenue at this I point. I mean, the revenue is like, you know, yes, many, many hundreds of millions of dollars and, and is profitable and they have, I think, the second highest revenue per employee in our portfolio. Very good. Do you uh, had a follow up? Is that a good no, answer? No, that's great. Thank you. Thank cool. You. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, okay. Go Somewhere over here. How much time we got, by the way? You, you got so definitely. You oh, are, 13 minutes. We got tons of time for questions. Definitely, you are very audacious in your thinking. But what do you look at? What traits or what instincts you look at the entrepreneur when you go out of it to Canada or Kenya or all the places and you see this five people team? So what are the traits or instincts, and how much time do you really invest understanding founders? Uh, thank you for asking that question. Look, understanding the founders, I cannot tell you how important it is. Like, I was just thinking, like, what is the one quality that helps me? Um, so you asked me what I did before we started, and I was the first product manager at Google, but then I switched to sales, and I did sales for Google in like 40 countries. I had to go to countries like Japan, where I had to sell for Google, where I don't even speak Japanese. I literally sent English uh, emails to customer service and ended up closing deals in Japan, not speaking a single word of Japanese. The point is that what it really taught me, uh, having to do that is, if you do not relate to the person on the other side, I would have been dead in my job. I wouldn't have even been here today, right? I would have been fired from Google. And that experience taught me how to relate to founders, right? So I had to do that for Google with portals. And I think a lot of times VCs confuse something. Just because you have money and you have check writing privilege doesn't mean that like, you cannot appreciate the other side. And I think the thing that really made us a difference, and we always make it a big point, but we listen. Um, that's why we do surveys. That's why we ask our founders what they care about. And so the most important thing, one of our biggest values is to listen to our founders and understand what's important for them and whatever it is to make it happen. The second thing you ask is what are the important things honestly like we used to ask a lot of different questions and the key thing we ask is just an open-ended question of what do you dream like what do you how do you define success like a couple years from now you raise all the money you want everything is working what does that look like and it, it is incredible how difficult that question is because unless you have an innate version of what excellence is you can easily define it and you can show a path to it and now you can deviate from that path as you're getting to it it's honestly like one of the most important things. As a result, you know, talk about being contrarian, 
me and all my team, the last six months, we've been reading books about how to ask questions, how to like talk to people, and how to understand you know, what, what they're all about. Um, so that's where we're spending a lot of time on these days. Great, we had uh, another one over here. Hey. How are you? Good, I didn't hear you mention Scopely. Scopely, uh, <laughs> great success. So Eric, uh, I've raised seed A, B a couple times, uh, and seen a lot of the incentives of yeah. the investors and the kind of different uh, VCs up close, both the pros and cons and conflicts. Curious how you do it from a stage agnostic approach, because you guys do seed A, B. Yeah, numbers. and we do it. And I th thank you for bringing up Scopely again in all, all trans. Did everybody hear the question, by the way, over here? Yeah. Uh, just say it a little louder. But you, you, you're, yeah, you're... sure. I was just curious, because there's not that many funds that really are stage agnostic. Yeah. Like, and there's a lot of internal conflicts a lot of times with both the structures, LPs, yeah. and internally, okay. yeah. and how that works for you guys. Because uh, these, you guys do do CDA, B. Yeah, and, we do. Yeah. Just, just a quick thing, Scopely is a company uh, from LA. Eric was a really important part of the company. Uh, honestly, like, I, I'm really, really proud of you guys' successes. You've done extremely well, and in fact, I mean, you, I, I think you're, you, you might even be more valuable than Ro Rovio at this point. Uh, so huge credit, and I, I only like had the, the courage to back you guys very early. But on the stage agnostic side, it comes back to Rolf's point that he raised the what's expensive, what's cheap, valuations. Look, I, I think a lot of people lose too much, you know, time on stage. Like it doesn't matter what the stages are. Like when we invested in Adyen, I think there was one other institutional investor. It was a very expensive round. There was no structure. Uh, it was. It seemed like a growth round. But the company grew like more than 10x since we invested. So if we had this religion of like we only invest in early stage companies, like people have this misconception that the only way you can get a high multiple is if you invest in the very beginning. Yes, all else being equal, the probability is higher. But don't confuse that with the fact that you can also find companies that still have so much room in front of them for growth that they can still be extremely valuable and generate high multiples. And I think the only thing that we do that's contrarian to not pay too much attention, like we've done a ton of deals in between rounds, all we look for is, look, what are the things that need to go right? How unique is the value proposition? And can we still find a great outcome for the time that we're coming in? And that's basically what made it special. And you know the founders really appreciate it because there are not many VCs out there that are telling them that you know, their company is loved and you know, they, they don't care about the stage as much. Anybody else? No? I'm out. You guys want some more networking time? Great, okay, thanks so much.